it didn't listen to me. It walked out of the thicket, it turned around and looked at me. They looked up and in this tree, there was a monkey man. And the monkey man jumped down out of the tree and started running away. And suddenly they're right in front of the car. He slams on the brakes and manages to stop. And he's skidding because it's not quite, you know, um, gravelling. And for literally for about a second and a half, they just stood there because they don't know where to go. And you tell them panicking, they're like roof flapping. Their 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 face is like twitching. Bigfoot Society. This is your host, Jeremiah Byron. Every week I talk to different people in the cryptozoology field. You never know who's going to be on next week. If you'd like to sponsor the show, head on over to patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. You get access to a ton of things there, including a close-knit cryptid community on Discord where you can connect with like-minded cryptid researchers and enthusiasts, weekly bonus content, the ability to hang out with each week's guest after the main show, exclusive merch, and much, much more. In this episode of Bigfoot Society, you get to talk to a new friend, Michael Mays, author of Valley of the Apes, all about what's really going on down there in southeast Oklahoma in good old Area X. So this is an interview you won't want to miss. Sit back, relax, and thanks for listening to another episode of the Bigfoot Society podcast. All right, Bigfoot Society, I have the privilege of uh, talking with a new friend, Michael Mays, uh, coming at us uh, from uh, the south, uh, down in the uh, the, the uh, uh, great state of Texas, correct, Michael? That is correct, central Texas, yeah. Oh, man, I am, I'm super excited to talk to you tonight. I mean, uh, we've all been reading uh, your book, uh, Valley of the Apes in the uh the patreon book club last few six last five six weeks we've been focusing on that and um uh, it's been just a super super fun experience but let's start out with a, a quick bio about yourself so that uh listeners know uh what you're all about so i'm gonna go ahead and uh so michael mays is a teacher of history and a former coach who resides in central texas an avid folklorist he has long been fascinated by the ghostly tales of historical and contemporary Texas, as well as mysteries of the natural world. Mays has authored three books, which are Patty, a Sasquatch Story, Shadow Cats, the Black Panthers of North America, and Valley of the Apes, the Search for Sasquatch in Area X. Uh, he's also the owner and writer of the Texas Cryptid Hunter blog, texascryptidhunter.blogspot.com. So welcome to the show tonight, Michael. Uh, glad to have you on. Well, I appreciate it very much. Thank you for having me. You got it. Uh, I always think that uh, we'll start by ch chatting about folklore. For me. I, I always think folklore is just fascinating, but I'm, I'm really curious to get your thoughts on it. Why is it so important, do you think, that we 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 focus on making an effort to preserve the, the stories of the past? Well, it's it's our shared history mm. you know it's um and and woven into folklore at least in my opinion often there are seeds of truth where something spawned that story and as fantastic as some story might seem there's often a grain of truth in it that you can if you can trace it back and get down to it uh that yeah, i just find that completely fascinating mm. um uh, and it's something I kind of came in into, you know, almost as a secondhand thing, you know, when, when I started the blog, it was mainly going to be based on cryptid related things, you know, I'm interested, but I, I do have a wider range of interest than that. Yeah. Um, and it kind of blossomed out from that because a lot of the, um, the historical accounts of, of out of place animals or what were they creatures kinds of things are they're hopeless hopelessly entangled with folklore you know mm, mm -hmm. um it, when you get into the earlier 1800s and things like that and um to try to weed out what might have been the truth you know in that story is something i just you know it's like a detective of 
uh, that's awesome job or a mystery you know you try to figure out so um mostly i just am a guy that has always loved a good story and mm. um just from that standpoint alone it's just very enjoyable um and uh it, like i said it's part of our shared history and it's, it would be a shame if all those you know died and went away oh, so i, I tried it, to yeah. i try to keep them alive did the love for folklore come first or was it something that kicked in after you uh became a a, a history teacher I, i'm not sure i can separate them okay because right. like i said they're kind of tied yeah. together and um now the the interest in kind of offbeat topics um that's something that's been with me since i was a kid you know and uh I, i've said this before to other people i grew up in a kind of a golden age of mm. bigfoot in the 70s yes um yep you know it was on tv there were specials the yeti the abominable snowman uh Loch Ness Monster, all that stuff, you know, there'd be a special oh, come on and my brothers and I, we'd be all over it. And when Bigfoot made an appearance on the $6 million man, I think my, was, fate, yeah. my fate was sealed, you know, oh, so, man. so good. And I just, I guess I never completely lost interest, even as an adult. Um, there was a gap in there where I didn't pursue it very much. I was trying to get through school, mm -hmm. got married, had a family and all that. Um, but as the internet started to really develop and take off there were there were all these um ways to gather information and read stories and and um hear about things that you'd never heard of the information that could be shared was so much greater than you know three or four books in your local library maybe and um with the advent of that um you know just exploded now i learned you have to navigate through a lot of uh silliness to get to the <laughs> the serious stuff you know but right um but even even that to a degree is enjoyable just uh again it's like a detective story trying to to get to the bottom of things oh i know man like um i've started to do that myself with like iowa uh cryptid history in like 1970s iowa bigfoot stuff that's a different story though that's another podcast but uh it's fun dude once you get once you start pulling at threads mm -hmm. and you're like how far is this going to go? And are these people still alive? Can I track them down? Right, and right. it's wild. It's like everyone should should take a swing at and see what they can uncover. It's a fun time. Um, curious, uh, you know, trying to discover these these folklore tales, these forgotten tales. Have you found that there's a a, a best uh, a best way to try to find all these like stories of the past. How do you usually go about that? Well, sometimes you, you just find out about them accidentally uh, while you're mm. actually looking for something else. For example, when I was doing the research for the, um, the book on the black, black Panther phenomenon, shadow cats, yeah. uh, I was looking for historical accounts of long tailed black Puma cougar sized cats, or larger in Texas. And uh, when, you, when you throw that net out there, sometimes you catch unexpected things. And uh, for one example uh, would be uh, uh, the Little House on the Prairie books, which are considered oh, yeah. biographical. They're, you know, they're stylized biographies, but, you know, uh, Wilder wrote those. Those were... Um, those are uh, remembrances of her childhood. And uh, there's a story in there about grandpa and the black Panther that she oh, relates. Yeah. And um, you know, that's, I, I never would have expected to be going down to the city library and checking out a Laura Ingalls Wilder <laughs> book as part of the research on that particular topic. But there it was, you know, and it was just, that was just, you know, really fun t to find that. And, um, it, it just spoke to the fact that people were aware of these cats all over the country and believed them to be real, even, you know, back then. And she didn't have any idea she would be writing about something that would become controversial. It was just, it's like where I grew up in yeah. Southeast Texas, black panthers were just another animal. They weren't common, but they were just another animal that lived out in the bottoms like That's a hog wild. or a coyote or something. And so nobody thought much about it. 
Um, but to, to, you know, to go out there and to find that, that, that was pretty cool. Uh, there's a great collector of folklore in Texas. His name is J. Frank Doby. Okay. He's probably the king of the folklorist in Texas. It's just oh, volume nice. after t- volume from the Texas Folklore Society. And, you know, I could spend all day just, just going through there because <laughs> every, every story is a great story. Now, it's not always connected to what I'm looking for, but, um, but you know, uh, sometimes it is. And, uh, um, you know, the, the legends of, uh, oh, the Black Panthers, you know, there's, there's stories called the Cougar Scream and the, or the Panther Scream, rather. And I just did a blog post about Texas' own version of the, the Headless Horseman. El Muerto, and that goes back to the frontier days, you know. Uh, and it turned out there was there was truth in it. You know, the rider was real. It turned out to be a corpse that had been beheaded and tied to a saddle, and wow, and turned loose and it rode around. And, and, and when they finally, uh, no other, ironically, the the Texas Ranger who figured it out was a guy named Bigfoot Wallace, ironic <laughs> name, and um. Uh, Wallace and his buddies, uh, they, they found this, uh, they found the horse and the rider, at, uh, the horse was at a watering hole and they, uh, they shot at the rider and it didn't seem to affect him at all. Like headless, you know? And wow. so they, so they turned their guns on the horse instead. And the horse went down like a, like a stone. And when they got there, they could see that it was a, uh, dried out you know, uh, corpse, um, almost mummified right, riding around out in West Texas for years. That's it was, wild. it was full of bullet holes and even had arrows in it where Indians had, uh, taken shots at it. <clears throat> but so this headless horseman was real. His head had been tied to the saddle horn. And, mm. um, so it was real, but there was an explanation and that's the fun in trying to, to, to get to the bottom of things, you know, where's that grain of truth in there? And, you know, like I said, I'm a sucker for a good story. And that, that was one good example of one. I I love that. And there's so many good stories like that on that, on your blog, the Texas cryptid hunter blog. It's crazy. And the thing I love is that in all of your posts, you have uh, your resources that you use. So if people want to go further and like people normally don't do that, that's really cool that you took the time you know, to put that in there for people that want to, you know, look at your sources and uh, go further. And yeah, everyone's got, I'm going to have that definitely in the show notes. Definitely check uh, Texas Cryptid Hunter blog out. It is a solid uh, wealth of Texas uh, folklore and and cryptids and so much. There's so much going on in that. Um, you allude to uh, in one of your posts that I was reading, you alluded to that you actually had a sighting of a chupacabra. Uh, is that something that you could um, kind of go into a little bit? Yeah, um, and I should clarify, you know, okay. down here down here in Texas, you know, the chupacabra legend got started in Latin America. Sure. I think the general consensus is it was in Puerto Rico. Right. It was where the, the genesis of this whole thing was. And it was um, originally, as described... It was this reptilian, reptilian, almost alien-looking creature, yeah, right? And it, it sucked Rico the blood one, yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. Somehow, now I think the story came to Texas and the South in general with Latin American immigration. If mm. that makes sense, you, okay. know, you bring your stories with you. You bring yeah, your folklore, makes sense. you bring your religion and, and your culture with you. Now, somehow, over the years, at least here in Texas. And it seems to have taken hold nationwide. The what these things are supposed to look like has changed. And mm. instead of being this reptilian, alien looking thing, it now is a hairless, grayish, mm-hmm. almost like an elephant skinned canine of some kind. Um, so in Texas, before the Chupacabra name really took hold, where I grew up, they were called blue dogs because they had this bluish grayish skin. And what we always had assumed they were, were just coyotes or foxes suffering from sarcoptic mange. And I don't know if you've ever seen an animal that's hair or fur covered 
that suddenly doesn't have it anymore, but they, they look completely alien. It's they look pretty like, gnarly. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's amazing. There, there's a, there's a pretty well-known photograph of a bear with mange and uh, there's a meme or something that goes with it. You know, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, you think a bear is terrifying with hair. You look at this one, you know, <laughs> or something like that. But, um, and it, it is a freaky looking thing. So that is what I and a, a buddy of mine saw in the Sam Houston National Forest several, you know, been quite a while back now. It was just uh, crossing a forest service road. And it was, uh, it was, it was coyote sized. It was completely hairless. It, it was that gray elephant looking wrinkly hairless skin maybe a slight bluish tint to it um it was clearly not a healthy animal it was uh if i remember right it even walked in a, a small circle once before it completed its oh, trip across the road and it just barely got off the road into the brush not very far at all we pulled right up next to it and then just sat there and watched it for several minutes and it just didn't even move for multiple minutes Finally, it did start to kind of creep away, but it just, it just did not, it was not a healthy animal. It was not a well animal. And to me, that kind of solidified that at least those particular versions of the story, what you're seeing are sick, mange ridden canines of some sort. Interesting. Now, I've, I've heard that some people, you know, there's a lady in Texas who, who shot one, had it mounted and, um, I, I'm, I've been told that they did some DNA testing on it and stuff, and it came back as part Mexican wolf and part oh, wow. coyote, coyote, something else. But um, I haven't actually seen those results myself. I've been told of them. Right. So I can't absolutely say that that's for sure. But um, I don't know if it's some kind of, I don't know why, uh, even if it is a hybrid between, a, say, a Mexican wolf and a, and a coyote or, or why it would be hairless you know like that but um that's what i saw was that one of these hairless blue dogs yeah man it's something about i grew up in new england and we've got our legends of the koi dogs and up mm -hmm. there the half coyote half wolves and it's just it's weird it's like uh americans love our weird dog coyote legends i think i don't know but um Moving on to, uh, I always love talking to people that have that have written uh, children's books just to to get like their thinking behind it. And you you've written uh, the a book about Patty, of mm -hmm. course. You know um, that uh, the famous Bigfoot sighting from 1967 that we all know and love. But uh, I'm just curious, you know, why did uh, what was your thinking behind? You know, I've got to uh, take this this uh, important. Uh, bigfoot tail and put it into a uh, a book format for kids what was the thinking behind that for you well it, it was kind of a kind of an epiphany i had i was actually at a, the texas bigfoot conference in tyler oh. texas when it kind of dawned on me there's been a lot of talk a lot of questions asked about why were why was roger patterson and bob gimlin why were they why did they pick that spot? Why were they mm. there at that perfect moment? And you, you know how people are, you know, that's right. Pretty, no, that's I know. Pretty convenient, yeah. You know, that, <laughs> yeah. um, of course I always counter my saying, well, who's more likely to find something, someone who's looking or someone who isn't looking. Right. So, but, True. but anyway, so there've been a lot of questions by people through the years, skeptics and such. And, uh, you know, why were you there? Why did you pick that spot? How did you know to go there? questioning their motives and and why they are in that location sure but it just kind of dawned on me um well why was the animal there mm -hmm. right and so <clears throat> that's something you know, i don't know it's probably just a not a normal person's thought i don't know but um and so that was the seed of it what led her the you know patty to be there at that time when those guys rode up Interesting. and over time, I probably, it probably rolled around in my head for close to a year, uh, kind of thinking of a backstory and you know, what led her to be there and, and all that kind of stuff. And why were these guys out looking for her and things like that? And, um, like I said, I thought about it for quite a while 
and uh, finally it seemed to kind of kind of gel in there and i sat and i wrote it in in an afternoon oh wow yeah and um a friend of mine his name's robert swain's a great artist out of arkansas he did the uh the illustrations were are, are amazing uh he did watercolors that were about three by two feet each those that's mm. the those are the originals those are the prints that uh we use for the illustrations um each one you know you, when you open a book it's you get the spine yeah, in the middle yeah it's one big portrait across both pages um and it's beautiful you know i told him uh i wanted something colorful bright something that was really striking you know like in the book i, I referred to from my childhood was where the wild things are something oh, like sure. that. Yeah. You know, something like that that would really be visually even for a little kid who couldn't read yet who just wanted would like to look at it and he just really nailed it and uh um, so, uh, we, we put that story together and then together we came up with an appendix that we put in the back of the book and he, he helped me too with this idea. We, we kind of hid little insider things in the illustrations. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. in the back of the book, we talked about, we called it the Sasquatch insider and, you know, here are the little hidden secrets that if you know these things, you'll really be a. That's Sasquatch awesome. insider, you know, so just little things like, um, um, for, for example, there's a, there's a, an illustration where Patty's peeking out from behind in a tree and she's watching a bulldozer, you know, clearing a road. And, uh, uh, this of course alludes back to the Jerry crew stuff exactly. when first found the print stuff like that. And of course there, there you have the big oil drum sitting there and that's yeah. a very famous part of that story about how something was coming around at night and flinging big oil drums and tires around. And, and so we, we, we said on this page, you'll see this oil drum. Here's what happened in 1958, you know, that's awesome. and, um, you know, why does the footprint look kind of humped up in the middle, you know, talk about the mid tarsal break and, and, things like that and even the names of uh some of the other characters the bully sasquatch that, that gives patty a hard time his name's jacko which is a very famous <laughs> yeah you know a story in in sasquatch yep. lore and we named her father giganto because the there big prevailing go. theory yep. is sasquatch is a descendant of gigantopithecus and so we talk about all that stuff in there to kind of uh in the back we we kind of reveal those things in that appendix. And, uh, I think that's, that might be my favorite part of the whole thing. That's actually. awesome. So th the adults are going to get, uh, something out of the book as well. Yeah. So, you know, little awesome. ones yeah. are going to like the illustrations, yep. young readers will like the story. And then even as you get older, you know, you read that appendix and, you know, you can pick up some things. And, and so, uh, and Robert did an outstanding job. It's worth it just for the illustration. I wish the writing was as good as the illustrations. That's yeah. I wish. So, I'm sure it but, is, yeah, though. but it, but it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, yeah. The more, the more kids books ca can be written about cryptozoology themes, the better is what I think, because that's, and they're starting to come out. I mean, STM is, is, uh, starting to, they're going to be coming out with a, a few, um, I know a vegetable man from, uh, West Virginia is, is the first one out for their kids series. Very cool. Um, let's start chatting about, uh, Valley of the Apes. So I, I'm going to assume that most of our listeners will know, but I may ask you a few questions that I, I know the answer to, but like, I don't want to assume all the listeners know there could be like some, some people that are just into like, you know, dog man or, or thylacine. And they're like, what mm -hmm. is area X? So, uh, what's, is there an elevator pitch that you give to people? And you're like, uh, when you, when you mention like, what's a wood ape or what's area X, like, okay. is there even possible to do a shortened version of that? You know? Well, a wood ape is just, we, we came up with that name. I wish I could tell you there was some deep scientific meaning behind it, but the North American Wood Ape Conservancy, this is the group I'm the chairman mm -hmm. of and, and the member of. And our working hypothesis is that this is most likely, this animal is most likely uh, a descendant of Gigantopithecus blackie, 
the, the mm. giant ape that we know existed in, in Eastern Asia. We believe it's not outlandish to think it could have crossed the, the land bridge during the Ice Age of Beringia and come over with like a lot of the other species did. Um, and what we're seeing now, what people are referring to as Bigfoot, it, it really is a, um, it checks most of the boxes physically for what people describe. We believe it's a flesh and blood animal uh, and that undoubtedly it's, it's a primate of some kind based on descriptions, hair covered, you know, mammal, you know, primate looking animal. And we, we think it's basically a North American ape that lives in the woods, hence wood ape. There that is also actually in East Texas, that's a historical term. Um, there are all kinds of local colloquialisms for Bigfoot. You know, when I was growing up in East Texas in the Piney Woods area, there were stories uh, out in the area that we call the Big Thicket of a wild man, a hair-covered wild man that lived out uh -huh. in the woods and left barefoot tracks and ran around. But it, the term Bigfoot was never used. And that had was starting to come into vogue. You know, the Patterson-Gimlin footage was, what was what, 67, I think. Yep. And yep. so I'm in the mid-70s. So it had been out a while. So Bigfoot, you're starting to hear that term. But as a kid growing up, that's not the term we heard. We heard wild man, old mossy back uh, was a term that was used for this thing. You know, it looked like it was draped in Spanish moss, which makes oh, me think wow. of like, uh, you've seen these big male orangutans with like uh, almost mm -hmm. like dreadlocks hanging off of them, mm -hmm. um, things like that. So you had these regional names and, you know, that's all across the South in the country, you know, Momo, the Missouri monster exactly. and 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 you could go on and on you know the uh, you know wood booger you've heard stuff like yep. that the deep deep south and then oh, uh, yeah. uh you know the boggy creek monster the chambers creek monster um these are all flaps that took place over the years and the term bigfoot really wasn't used um wild man was used a lot and it was i was really embarrassingly old before i started to uh think well maybe what people are talking about seeing locally, regionally, might be the same animal they're talking about seeing in the Pacific Northwest. Mm. And, um, you know, like I said, I was embarrassingly late to that party probably, but, uh, um, but that's kind of how we started to put that all together. Um, but, uh, you know, just the interest was always there. And um, so, but that's where the name wood ape comes from. That's another local term that was you'd gotcha. hear bush ape you'd hear bush ape and wood ape or, and uh, bush monkey and you're like this is texas man they're not supposed to be <laughs> monkeys or, or apes out exactly. here exactly so. you, you that's what people want us to believe but they're you know you read books like valley of the apes and i mean you've got these locations like area x in southeast oklahoma and the Wachita Mountains, it's almost like there's this this lost world that yeah. like they've gotten trapped in there or something. It's very yeah. interesting. It's um I think the, the the biggest reason people have a hard time uh, buying into this phenomenon is that most people don't believe there are wild places like this left. Mm -hmm. you know, or if there are, maybe the Pacific Northwest maybe Africa, uh, somewhere in Africa, I could believe in the deepest, darkest jungles or the Amazon, I could believe in it. Maybe Alaska, you know, maybe, mm -hmm. um, but Oklahoma, you know, and I think the problem is kind of like the way people think of Texas. They think of Texas that they see in the old John Wayne Western movies. It's a dry, right. dusty desert. Right. You know, you ride by the same rock 50 times when you're on horseback, you know, and, um, and there are parts of Texas that certainly are like that. And they think of Oklahoma as just this flat grassland, prairie, endless sea of grass kind of a deal where the buffalo used to roam and things like that. And certainly most of the state does fit that description. But the eastern portion of both those states are heavily wooded. And as a matter of fact, there's more acreage of forest when you compare East Texas East Oklahoma, West Arkansas, and Western Louisiana, that four-state area, 
the forest that is still left there is bigger than the entire state of Washington. Whoa. So there's a lot of forest land there. And it is a little more segmented and parceled up than the Pacific Northwest, but it's also a much richer environment. These are um, deciduous forests with uh, fruit-bearing, nut-bearing trees, incredibly rich environments. This is why we have such a big hog problem down here because there's just so much for them to eat. In the Pacific Northwest, you've got uh, your forester conifer, coniferous forest. They're dominated by uh, by pines and um, other coniferous trees, you know, and they're not nearly as rich. You know, uh, the Sierras, for example, are a good example of what we call a high desert. There's really not a lot of food stuff there. And so um, an animal that is trying to make a living in either forest, that same animal would require less, a smaller home range in our region than it would probably require up in the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. just because it, the forests are so much richer. And um, so, but people don't understand that, you know, most people don't get off the concrete much anymore. Exactly. Um, even hunters, um, they tend to not get more than a couple hundred yards off the four wheeler trail or something, because if they kill something, they got to haul it out. Right. You know, right. so you don't want to be five miles into the swamp, yeah. you know? And so people just don't realize those spots are still around. Now they're getting smaller and they're getting more difficult to find, but there's still some out there. Mm. Th this book is it's, it's fascinating. So it's such a fascinating book. I mean, first I want to say like, you did such a good job. This is not just like, uh, okay, this happened, this happened. Like it's actually written like, um, like part two, especially it should be a movie the way that it's written. <laughs> like you do a really good job, Michael, of like um, the whole time I'm reading it. Like I read the entire part two in a day. I was like, Oh, I'm getting into the area X stuff. The first part is right. awesome. It's all the history, right? It's right. leading up to it. The part two, it's like, Oh my goodness. It's like, like they're getting, they go into the Wachita mountains to the different areas, the area X. And it's like, they get out and like stuff starts happening like crazy, you know, like stuff getting thrown on top of cabins. Uh, mm -hmm. They, they start to see stuff and it's just, it keeps going and going. And it's like, it doesn't let up. And then you, man, my favorite parts, I got to ask you. So like Daryl Collier, right. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of parts where like, and I, I've got to talk to Daryl because it's like, he sounds like he's the coolest dude, but like he gets really into it. it it's yeah. it's almost like he it's like, a, and I mean, this is a compliment in like the movie predator when like Schwarzenegger's like, come on, do it. And it's like, yeah, he gets yeah. like very, very emotional. Uh, and um, just the way mm -hmm. it was written, I was like, Oh my goodness, this is like intense. I'm loving it. Um, was there a, is there a part uh, or an experience when you're, um, you know, researching in this area where, um, uh, do you remember one? Uh, I mean, you've seen uh, Wood Apes multiple times in Area X, right? I think you you call that out in your blog. Or is there uh, a story that you you wouldn't mind sharing of a, a time that really sticks out to you in your memory? Yeah. Now, the best sighting of one I ever had was okay. actually in Texas in the Sam Houston National sure, Forest. Yeah, yeah, but, sure. But as far as X goes, I have been lucky enough to get just a couple of flashes. I haven't had that big, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's one of the criticisms we sometimes get. You guys see these things all the time and you got no pictures. And the, the window of opportunity is so fast and they don't hang around. I, th I think the Patterson Gimlin footage, if it's done, if there's anything bad about it, it's giving the false impression that these things roam around out in the open all the time. And that's just not the case. Mm. That's just not the case. And there's not many open spots um, out in that particular region anyway. It's very rough and tumble and rocky and steep and heavily forested. And not just the trees, but the underbrush, green briar and poison ivy and stuff everywhere. It's just, you know, it's just incredibly difficult to, to maneuver in. And so to try to chase them is folly. I mean, you okay. just, you just can't, you know? So, um, we're dependent 
you know, we try to lure them in sometimes, but basically we we just try different things to, if they're primate, they're intelligent, intelligent mm-hmm. animals have a, a curious nature. Sure. And we try to do different things to try to bring them in and hopefully we can get a glimpse and, you know, get the proof we're looking for. Um, as personally, the most intense experience I've yeah. had was an audio encounter. I didn't see it at all. Uh, I and a fellow member named Tony Schmidt, we were sitting in camp. We were running. One thing we tend to do is run what we call a cold camp. We don't build fires. Um, and um, uh, <laughs> a guy in Washington, I was on a camping trip in Washington a decade ago, kind of shame me. He said fires in the summer were for people who were scared. So from then on, I just, <laughs> it's like, well, that gum and I guess I can't build a fire anymore, you know? So, um, but we, we, you know, we tried it. We tried running the cold camp. And uh, what we found is when they were around, they, they would, they were hanging around camp, keeping an eye on us. Why? Wow. I don't know. I, I guess, that, you know, they don't have YouTube. They don't have Netflix. Yeah. We're it, totally. right? Yeah. So, right. And so the less light there was, the tighter they would have to come. I think they probably see better than we do at night, but that, you know, they're not like, you know, seeing like the predator does, for example, you know, that's, right. uh, you know, primates are very sight oriented, but, uh, and their eyes are bigger. They're going to capture more ambient light and see better than, than ours do just based on size alone, probably, but they did have to come in a little closer. And so that's the reason we were sitting there, um, you know, we we're just talking and uh, observing, listening, and so, uh, I'll try to give you the layout of, of the camp. We've got a small hunting cabin. We were right right in front of that, near a fire pit that was in that was you know there was nothing lit in it. Uh, to the west of the small cabin, we have what we call it the hooch. It's a um, mm-hmm. it's basically a metal um, carport. Basically, it's it's got the the, the metal top. And on one side, it's got a wall that, that comes all the way down to the ground. The other three sides are open, just poles, supports. And um, the cabin and the hooch both back up to a mountain slope. Uh, and we get a lot of weird noises and rocks flying off the mountainside, you know, yeah. from, from, from that slope. And there's a little dead spot from where we were sitting between the cabin and the hooch, there's a little area kind of offset because that wall comes down to the ground where we were sitting. We couldn't see that little spot. Okay. And so suddenly we hear this something. It's like, it's got a big club or a big log or stick or something. And it just starts beating the hell out of the ground. Wow. Bam, bam, bam. Oh, man. And whatever it is, is swinging this whatever it had so powerfully and swiftly. If you've ever watched a golf tournament on TV, you know that the sound it makes right before contact with the ball. You hear the yep. whoop. You yep. hear it cutting the air. You could hear whatever it, it had in its hands cutting through the air the instant before it it struck the ground and it just bam 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 and we just um it was shocking you know we we know both of us have been in the group for a long time and we've experienced a lot of strange stuff but that we hadn't experienced that Mm. but we were okay hold your ground don't get up we had a thermal unit we scanned but we're blocked right we can't see Hold your ground. Maybe it'll creep up a little closer and we'll get a look at it. A few minutes later, it does it again. And it does sound closer. Oh, man. Okay. <clears throat> and this time it sounds like it's right under that metal structure, 20 feet from us. Now it's pitch black, right? It's mm. just dark as it can be. And this time it's, so it starts beating the ground again. Bam, 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 bam. And I mean, it was even louder. It was even, it, you had the impression it was mad, whatever it was, you know, right. It, it's, uh, we speculated initially, is it maybe trying to kill something to eat? Is it, you know, or something like, but 
The second time it was closer and it seemed like classic kind of intimidation okay. behavior, right? So it sounded so close and I could not, we could not see it on the thermal unit. So I'll be honest with you. I thought this thermal unit's broken. <laughs> it's right there. This thing is not working and this thing's about to be in our lap. So we lit up the hooch, the carport yeah. area. We're, and we use it to keep uh, equipment and things dry because it rains a lot up there. And we expected to see it standing right there. Wow. And we hit the lights, nothing. Mm. There's nothing there. We got up, we looked around the corner, the blind corner, nothing. We can't see anything. No, and no eye shine up on the mountain. And, we, and of course, we didn't hear it retreat, whatever it was. So we're like, okay, uh, let's do this. We're going to go up onto the porch and, and we have um, uh, a system of, of observation at night we call overwatch. Right. We learned uh, years ago that these thermal units can see through black plastic, like garbage bag plastic. So we create these panels to hang down off, off the porch so that whatever's out there cannot see us sitting on the porch, but we have eyes with the thermal looking through the thin plastic and we can see a thermal image of anything that comes by. Uh, so we go in, we open and shut the door, pretending like we went inside and we sat on the porch and I'm sitting right on the edge of the porch. We had not been out there, but just a couple of minutes. And it sounded like it was right next to me. It came back again and bam, and I mean, this time it was just, go i mean just going to work beating the ground and it's so bam 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 and it was faster and faster and faster and then the last thing we heard is something hit the metal wall of that hooch so hard it it rang it like a bell and it just wow. re it reverberated for two minutes after the fact i don't know if it threw something or whatever it had in its hand that was hitting the ground with it turned and hit the wall of, of that you know and again we we burst out you know to try to catch it to get a look at it and we saw nothing um and there's something about knowing there's something there but not being able to see it yeah i bet that was really intense and uh now that was the last time it visited us that <sighs> night Man. but you know you're like it was clearly powerful strong and if you think about it for something to use a club or grab a log and beat on it, it has to have hands. A bear can't do that. And so that's a pretty sobering thought yeah. to have that it's right here somewhere and we can't see it. And uh, now maybe it was a little farther away than it sounded like it was. If, and if it was, then it was even stronger and more powerful for that sound to sound like it was that close, you know, and maybe it threw something down off the mountain to hit the hooch, the last sound. I don't know, but it was, um, it was crazy. It, it's probably the single, well, I don't know. There's been a lot of crazy up there, but that was probably the most intimidated I've ever. Okay. Heard. Okay. Um, if you like that story, literally Valley of the Apes is full of, it feels like, you, I would, I read hundreds of stories like that. I mean, just like the book has, and it, the cool thing is that you go to the website and there's sounds that you can hear that go along with, there's an appendix mm -hmm. in the back and the sounds are just incredible. And, um, but the, the, I want to make sure I get this question in, um, the end of the book, it, it states how there's a, there's a pivot in the mission of the mm -hmm. NAWAC you're now tr you're you're realizing, hey, let's try to gain this this photo evidence, these track casting, the stuff we haven't gotten so far because we've been focused on other things. How has that change in focus gone for you guys? Uh, has has anything come out of that? We have um, gone back and forth over what kind of okay. evidence do we think will be sufficient sure. for mainstream mainstream science to um recognize this as a real animal document it mm -hmm. move it from folklore and myth to the biology zoology section of the library right 
And we tried years ago, uh, we had a big camera trapping project we called Operation Forest Vigil. We had camera traps in the Big Thicket National Preserve in East Texas. Mm -hmm. And we had them up in here in, in, in Area X. And I should tell you the story of how Area X got its name. It sounds really creepy and cool. Um, <laughs> I wish I could tell you it was thought out. You know, it's like <laughs> X-Files, but it, it really wasn't. We had three study areas. Yep. And we called them areas X, Y, and Z. We could have just as easily called them areas A, B, and C, but we didn't. We called them X, Y, and Z. Exactly. Um, our permit to operate in the big ticket, that was area Y. Um, that expired. A new superintendent came in, and he told us we couldn't go back in there anymore. So area Y, you know, we got kicked out. Area Z was private land in East Texas. And uh, that turned out to kind of be a bust mm -hmm. um, in hindsight. I think it was probably the whole thing was probably a fabrication that, okay. and, and that, that we weren't getting the real story. Sure. And so that left area X, which was this area in, in Southeastern Oklahoma. So mm -hmm. like I said, it sounds really creepy and mysterious and it is, I guess, but th that wasn't the intent, you know, when right. we started to call it that, but um, <laughs> it doesn't make a very good story. Maybe I should make up a story for that, for the naming of it. I don't know, but. But the story um, is in the book. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. It's I fun just, to know the history it, of like how yeah, you it, get it, to that point. That's it's very you know, cool. The book was, the idea was a warts and all yeah. kind of thing. And I wanted to write it like a story in a narrative kind of style. That's one thing that I thought when I, when I looked at the other books on the, uh, on the topic, a lot of real scholarly works, you know, and, and really uh, some of them are kind of dry. Like if you've ever read any of Grover Krantz's stuff, it's a lot of data and, and stuff. And it's, it's fascinating, it's, it's, but you got to be really yeah. into it. To you got to be focused. Books, yeah. Right. Yep. And so I wanted to write it in, um, you know, like a narrative, you know, mm -hmm. like a story, but it's a, it's a true story. And, um, so that was the goal. And I want, you know, cause I wanted it to be fun to read, easy to read, but be telling the real story. Exactly. And, and so that was, that was kind of the goal. But, um, back to the original question, the, the, the camera trapping project was a bust. Okay. Um, we had, we had a handful of images that were, I guess you intriguing, compelling, you know, sure. but certainly nothing that would have, suffice as any kind of proof and over the years we really started to doubt whether any photograph mm. um, would would be good enough for that because with the advent of you know the, the continuation of, of development of technology you can go down to office max now and buy photoshop anybody can do right. it and, right and we started to talk among ourselves you know here you've got the patterson gimlin footage that regardless of what people some people say it has never been successfully debunked. Um, broad daylight, color, yeah, what a minute of yeah. this thing walking. True. You see yeah. muscles flexing. Yep. You see um, the mouth moving. You see the fingers flex. You see the toes. You know, kind of you know flex up as it takes its step. And this is these are things that don't match up to costumes, especially in 1967. Right. And we just started talking we, and we thought, you know, I don't know if any picture will ever be good enough. And now it might even be less valuable because of technology and the ability mm. to manipulate photo evidence. And so we shifted away from that for a while. And, you know, the truth of the matter is I, I and it's not a pleasant um, thing, but I think it's going to take a specimen to prove it to science. It's going to take sure. a, a holotype, a specimen. And so we focused our efforts on that. It was nothing anybody relished, but the thought was science. You got to think in terms of populations, not individuals. And the thinking was, and, and we got this from reading John Green's book. Mm -hmm. John Green was a big proponent of this. You know, if, if we can take one, prove it's real now we can save them all we can't go to the government now and ask hey can you rope off the washita's and make it <laughs> yeah right a, a sanctuary for wood yeah. eggs? 
we might as well be going in and asking them to create a unicorn sanctuary. Yep. Right. As exactly. far as they're concerned. So they, <clears throat> excuse me, they have to be proven real. That's an unpleasant reality, I think. Um, and so we concentrated our efforts on that. We really hoped we'd stumble, you know, the best case scenario. We walk on one that's old and gray, was 100 years old and died of a heart attack right. of natural causes. Right? That would and be we, nice. That yeah. would, you know, it yeah. lived its full life and yet we had the proof we need and all that. Yeah. But we really did concentrate on that. Now, um, while doing that, we, we had several opportunities that are documented in the book, near misses, we call them. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But there were other times where, you know, in all these years, only a handful of shots were ever taken. And, mm -hmm. um, but there were many other times where our guys had in a thermal scope. In the sights. They had something. Yep. Now, the one thing about... And this is a misnomer, you know, our, our critics, oh, they're running around the woods shooting anything that moves, right? We we pulled the trigger five times in 15 years. Wow, that's, that's you know? wild. Yeah. And so, um, so that's just not true. And the first thing you learn when you're a hunter, at least down here in Texas, where it's kind of ingrained in the, in the culture, you must be able to 100% identify your target. And we exactly. have put in very strict protocols for that. And so you're seeing something big and it's compelling and it's intriguing. And you think you're 99% sure that that's one, hmm. but you can't pull the trigger on that. Right. Yeah. You just can't. Um, but it had, we been taking video through a, a thermal scope. Yep. You know, we had a thermal scope, but it didn't take video. So right. we thought, well, all these years, we've only had these few chances to collect a specimen. And it just hasn't gone our way. But we've had more, not a lot, but we've had more opportunities to get footage. Now, maybe it was thermal footage, you know, but footage nonetheless. And so we thought, well, let's let's pivot mm -hmm. and let, let's spend some money on the best thermals out there. Oh, yeah. With video capability. Um, and let's see if we can do that. Um, and let's see where that goes. Now, um, as luck would have it, that's about the time COVID hit. Right. Um, you, you saw that at the end of the book. We went up there were about yep. two years where we yep. could hardly get in there because most of our membership lives in Texas. We've got others as far flung, far away as Maine, mm -hmm. you know, and Tennessee and and California. You know, they're all over. Um, and it was so difficult to travel during that whole pandemic and uh and some people weren't working so the expense you know to to make that trip and things like that were it was just so but there were better part of two years two summers where we mm. hardly got in there at all wow and it was during that hiatus where we really um decided to you know let's let's change it up let's try something new and um <clears throat> we're not i don't want to mislead anybody we're not against the collection of a specimen like i said one mm -hmm. that, that's what we're thinking one to save them one. all yeah that's exactly. the idea yeah uh and um but we think our chances of collecting either video be it thermal imagery or um photographs or, or daytime you know we, we think so you don't have to be sure of your target when you're clicking a camera button yeah, or if you're right. wearing like a police camera on right, so like, you know you, you know? now the, the whole GoPro thing we've tried that that's a bust. Oh, okay, the, the battery it, like, it just doesn't well, last. Okay. And, and you okay. know when you do get something that's that big in the screen, you know, yeah, you know, sure, it's, it's, sure, it's sure. tough. So okay, but um, but you know you can fire away with that camera. Oh yeah. If, oh, it's oh it turned out it's a bear. Okay, well nothing's hurt, right? You hit delete and you're done, and and that's it. Um, you can't do that with a rifle exactly and um and so our guys kind of like the idea of being free to let's just go to town we'll sh we will <laughs> shoot everything in the forest now but we'll do it with a camera right and so uh we, we are giving more emphasis to that we've um uh, we instituted another uh camera trap project we called it hadrian's wall we had a we yeah. tried to put this picket line of cameras up around the camp uh, see if we could catch anything. 
hoping that the camera technology had improved since the forest vigil operation years before. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not convinced it's that much better. Okay. Um, but I think we did learn, uh, you know, we didn't get the pictures we wanted, but I think that we learned something from that too. I think we learned, okay, they're walking the ridge. They're walking the mountainside. Mm -hmm. They're not walking the valley floor when they approach us, which there were native American tribes that called them ridge walkers. And so, yeah, we're like, okay, you know, there, there, there's that seed of truth, right? There's that little grain that we were talking about with folklore, you know, these ridge walkers. At, and we think at least when they're, they're approaching us, they're walking the ridge. They're not walking the valley floor. Now, do they descend the ridge to get closer at times, the slope? I believe they do. But um, when we're in camp, I think they know it. And, and when they choose to come close, I think that's the route they're taking. So I think we did learn that. Um, but so that's, that's the nature of the pivot. Uh, it was just, um, it was just, you know, we don't have to be nearly as cautious with the camera. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, you know, perfectly true. Yeah. And we had a perfect example and it's in the book. Uh, remember, uh, Ken Helmer was in a ghost blind, which if you know what that is, that's a mirrored kind of blind. It reflects the, the ground around these, these panels that you put up and it can kind of conceals you. And he was looking down a Creek bed and one just stepped out and oh, was goodness. looking down. Now it was, you know, 80, hundred yards away. Yeah. And he, he watched it and it was looking right at him. It, it, it took note of the ghost blind. It, something didn't look right to it. And it was trying to figure out, I think what it was looking at and it sidestepped back into the woods yeah. And he's like, Dad, come, was that what I thought it was? You know? <laughs> and as he's thinking about it, it steps back out again. And it's solid black from head to toe, long arms. Um, uh, and he's, who is that? You know, that's yeah. what you know. And he goes, what is that? Who is that? And he's leaning forward, trying to see, trying to figure out what it is. By the time he realizes that's not a who, that's a what, it steps back in the woods and never comes back again. Whereas if he had had a camera, yeah. you know, he's oh. firing away and, yep. and, you know, if it turns out to be a game warden or a, or a teammate or whoever, well, no harm done. Right. Yeah, No foul. Yep. Exactly. But you can't, you can't do that oh, when you're, man. when you're carrying a rifle. So, yeah. So that, that's why, that's the nature of the, the pivot and why. I love it. I love it, man. Michael, it has been so fun talking to you. I, I can't believe we're at the end of the hour already. But like if you, that was just a small little sampling of. If you like those stories you just heard, I'm serious. I'm going to have the book link in the show notes. Get that book today and you're you're going to find stories upon stories. It's it's I would say it's it's the number one cryptozoology book of the year and if someone gets bent out of shape, come on, dude. <laughs> well, I appreciate give it, it. Give it a read. Give it a read. Um, Michael, thank you so much for coming on. Can you take mm -hmm. a few minutes and uh, and remind people of how to keep up to date with what you're doing and sure. uh, the NAWAC? Sure. Uh, we'll start with the NAWAC sure. first. Um, the The website is woodape.org. Now, you you had mentioned the, the sounds appendix in the back of the book. Yes. Uh, we have taken that idea that was that's that was very popular people really liked having those links to go and, and listen to those things that were described in the book uh we've taken that and we have not quite emptied the vault of all our audio recordings but we have linked now on our site dozens and dozens more audio files that um that are not listed in the back of the book so you can go there to woodape.org and listen and um they're very, very interesting. They're mm. very interesting. I think people will really like that. So visit that and, and listen to those audios and, and see what you think. It's, it's a lot of fun. Nice. Um, personally, you know, the Texas Cryptid Hunter blog, if, if you're, it's not just Bigfoot related, it's all kinds of stuff. It's just whatever weird thing strikes me at the time. It's Texas Cryptid Hunter dot dot com. I'm not as regular the last couple of years, I haven't been as regular uh, keeping it up. I've tried to get back to, to writing on it more regularly because I've been working on the book project so much. Mm -hmm. 
and you know i still work full time and and you know there's only so many exactly, hours in exactly day, so. yeah but i'm trying to get back to it a little more so that's again texas cryptid hunter uh you can google that and find it right. i would appreciate it personal website is michael c mm -hmm. and you know I, i'll list if i'm doing an interview or an appearance giving a talk any new book or blog post uh nice. this kind of the catch-all for everything and then there's there's also a texas cryptid hunter facebook and twitter page so any and all of that stuff um i'd appreciate everybody's support and definitely um we we're, we're trying to do it right we're taking it seriously and um it's it's bare bones stuff and when we do stuff well uh you'll hear about that but like as you know if you read the book we, you know we screwed up we screwed up some and There's some learning experiences in that book for sure yeah, you, yeah. And you'll, you'll hear yep. that as well and oh, it's, yeah it's somebody else that's out there uh trying to do the same thing we are because you know there are other yeah. groups out there doing good work oh you sure know, it's yeah. not just us we know that but if mm -hmm. if somebody else can learn from a mistake we made maybe they can duplicate the experiment and they don't make the same mistake right because the ultimate goal is to get them documented. I yep. would love it to be us who does it, but if it's the Olympic project, sure. I'm, thr I'm thrilled, right? Yep, you know, exactly. it doesn't if it's a logging truck that runs over one in East Texas, and that's how we get this, you know, <laughs> you know, two. I'm sorry for that one, but but you yeah. know what? It's documented now. It's and, true. It's documented. You know, yeah. So however it happens, um, I'll be excited about it. There and, you go. and if we can help in that regard by here's what worked, here's what didn't, here's where we messed up, here's what we did well, adapt to your own needs and, and things like that and uh, add to it, take away from, you know, whatever you think will work. You just, um, my college basketball coach said, you know, tonight we're playing a team that's bigger than us. We're going to, uh, we're going to throw every rock we got in our pocket right so yeah, there you that's go. what we're yeah. trying to do we're trying to throw every rock in a pocket and, and and see what works well michael thank you so much again for coming on uh everyone i've said it enough times but i'm gonna say it again go get a copy of that book i'm serious it's really good but uh michael's good nice enough he's gonna stay on for a little bit longer hang out with the the patreon group and we got some more questions uh for him but uh thanks again so much for coming on michael Oh, thank you for having me. I had a good time. Thank you. Again, a special thank you to Michael Mays for coming on to Bigfoot Society and, and for hanging out for the uh, after show uh, for the Patreon uh, audience. Um, that after show that happened was probably, I would say, the best after show in the history of Bigfoot Society uh, due to the questions that were uh, asked by the attendees. I mean, if you're wanting to hear the information about how last summer was for the NAWAC, it came out in the after show. And if you want to hear about stuff really recent, uh, Megan asked a question that hit the nail on the head. Uh, and and Scott and Alan were asking questions. My goodness, I'm proud of uh, of uh, the members I got in the Patreon. But if you want to hear <laughs> the crazy stuff that came out in the after show, just check out patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. Uh, you can support the podcast. And I know this is going to be like the third time you hear it in the episode, but I just want you to know there's some crazy stuff in the after show that came out. Uh, but, uh, Thanks again for listening. Uh, now on to the regular announcements. Thanks for listening to the Bigfoot Society podcast. Please take a few minutes to review the show on iTunes five stars as it does help us get into the eyes and ears of more listeners on iTunes. Uh, that will help us just get bigger and bigger and get even better quality guests for future shows. Uh, also, if you have any Bigfoot encounters or cryptid encounters, please send your stories and uh, audio and photos, whatever you've got, over to BigfootSociety at gmail.com. 
If you'd like to become more involved with Bigfoot Society and get some extra content, we do have a Patreon uh, where you can get all sorts of cool things. For example, for $7 a month, you get extra Bigfoot Society content, uh, usually interviews, but other things as well. You get a sweet membership card and a vinyl sticker that I send to you in the mail. You get access to the Bigfoot Society after show, which is an extra interview after the main interview with the weekly guest. And usually they are up for uh, Patreon members to be in that extra show segment with them and me. And you get to ask your uh, question live to them and get an answer from the guest, which as you've seen what guest we've had in the past, this could be a really big deal. There's also a private Discord where you can get involved with uh, talking to me one-on-one -on -one and the community there, and that's always a great time. You can find the Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. Uh, we're very thankful for all our supporters that we have in so many different ways and appreciate uh, all our listeners coming back week after week to listen to more cryptozoology-based interviews. Uh, thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Bigfoot Society. Any content provided by our guests are not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone. Thank you.